Because what the Lord promised, He will give. He will fulfill. And the reason we know that is because He's told us not just what He's going to do, He's told us what we need to do in order to uh, receive it and follow it out. So we have a promise. Last week, we had a little parenthetical message, a break in the series on Joshua. And we talked about our name change, Pentecost. It was uh, wonderful. And we're going through kind of all that transition this week with all of our tech. And uh, uh, Facebook still hasn't approved our name change. Some of all that stuff we're, we're working through, uh, getting that, uh, the sign design, getting that ordered, all that we're working through uh, this week. But the service last week was special. It was um, uh, for us who... Uh, are, are a part of this church for you and myself, and I think a historic thing, something that we don't ever want to forget and we want to hold on to and steward well. And so um, that was a, though a break, though, from these uh, six weeks that we've been in the book of Joshua. And the reason the Lord has us in Joshua is because we are walking into uh, possessing our victory, uh, taking what God has for us. So the wilderness years is losing that mindset that, 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 cap, that puts you in captivity, puts you in bondage, losing that slave mentality of being broken down by, uh, by Egypt, by the world, and by the enemy. And we want to walk in freedom and possess all that God has for us as a church. And uh, that's possessing the gifts, that's possessing the fullness of the Holy Spirit, that's possessing uh, a, a tangible, beautiful relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to have all of that. And we talk about Joshua what stories come to mind? I mean, one of the first ones is Jericho, right? The walls of Jericho. We finally made it. I know some of the kids were excited about the walls of Jericho, and I was like six weeks later, like, are we ever going get to get to the walls? Come tumbling down? I mean, come on, I'm, I'm ready for this, uh, this uh, awesome story. And believe it or not, if, if you're not familiar with the book of Joshua, the walls of Jericho falling, as amazing and significant as it is, is not the best story in my opinion, in the book. So we'll get there. Joshua 10, Joshua 10, when the sun stands still, that's epic. But walls coming down is pretty good, and especially in the manner in which they uh, came down. So uh, we're going to read just a, a few verses. Uh, I don't think I put any verses in. Uh, did I? I put them in? Okay, we're going we're gonna to jump in here and read a few verses from Joshua chapter 6. Yeah, those are old verses. I'm sorry, that's last week. those are last week's verses, so that's, a, that's a, a terrible, critical mistake on my part. Sorry, Joe. So you're going to have to use your Bibles, your, your phone apps, uh, whatever. Joshua chapter 6, and uh, I knew when I did the PowerPoint I missed something. I just missed the Bible. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, Joshua 6, verse 1 in the NLT. Now the gates of Jericho were tightly shut. Because the people were afraid of the Israelites, no one was allowed to go out or in. But the Lord said to Joshua, I have given you Jericho, its king and all its strong warriors. You and your fighting men should march around the town once a day for six days. Seven priests will walk ahead of the ark, each carrying a ram's horn. And on the seventh day, you are to march around the town seven times with the priests blowing the horns. We're in verse 5 now. When you hear the priests give one long blast on the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can, then the walls of the town will collapse and the people can charge straight into the town. Verse 18, do not take any of the things set apart for destruction, or you yourselves will be completely destroyed and you will bring trouble on the camp of Israel. Everything made from silver, gold, bronze, or iron is sacred to the Lord and must be brought into his treasury. When the people heard the sound of the ram's horns, they shouted as loud as they could, and suddenly the walls of Jericho collapsed, and the Israelites charged straight into the town and captured it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your wonder-working, your miracle-working power. And we ask, Lord, I ask you this morning that walls would come down. Uh, I ask that, that for uh, my loved ones here, my brothers and sisters in Christ who are here this morning, that you would expose walls that we have been putting up with, that we have chosen to believe will not come down, and that you will tear them down this morning. 
And we ask this, Jesus, in your holy name. Amen. At the end of the message, I'm going to invite you forward for prayer. And um, I'm, I want you thinking during the message about any walls, obstructions to freedom in your life that may be up, because we want to pray about those and, uh, and see what the Lord wants to do. I was reminded this week as I prepared this message, the first sermon I ever wrote, I was seven years old. It's a stretch to call it a sermon, but my grandpa was a preacher and my dad was a preacher, so I felt like I should be writing sermons, stepping, it out, stepping out this call to preach. So as a seven-year-old who felt recently called to uh, be a preacher, I wrote a sermon called, By Faith, the Walls of Jericho Came Down. And that's really the only thing worth repeating from the sermon. I got it. I had my son dig it out of this old locker we have. I read it, and I was like, oh, it's not as great as I remember it being. Uh, so, but I have that phrase, by faith, from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25, by faith, the walls of Jericho came down. And, uh, and so, hey, I wrote a sermon. Hopefully, this one's better. Uh, I've had 30 years of practice. Um, but I want to go through just the narrative of the story here quickly uh, to tell us what happens in the text before we apply it to our lives. Uh, so first, we see the promise for victory. We read that together here in Joshua 6. Uh, the Lord gives the word to Joshua. So two weeks ago, we were looking at these uh, unique events that happened right before this battle. They had just crossed the Jordan River, and now on the other side of the Jordan, there's this ritual of circumcision, there's this celebration of the Passover, and there's this confrontation or encounter with the captain of the army uh, of the Lord, the captain of the or, uh, or the Lord of hosts. And so this Old Testament appearance, in my opinion, of Jesus, where uh, he comes down and he shows us who's really winning these battles and, uh, and whose promised land is being taken. This isn't a promised land um, so that Joshua can be honored or that the Israelites can be especially honored, although they have a special place with the Lord. Uh, this is Jesus taking uh, possession of, uh, of this place where he will one day rule and reign as king of kings. So there's this encounter between Joshua and Jesus. And, uh, and now we learn in this story what actually was said. Because other than, uh, are you my friend or my foe, there's not, a, there's not a whole lot recorded in that chapter about the conversation. So the, the chapter changes, it moves on, and you're like, oh, I want to know more about the encounter. Well, it's right here. We read it. Uh, the Lord gave instructions to Joshua, and it seems like it was right there in that encounter. I have given you Jericho, its king, and all its strong warriors. And then he gives him the strategy of what he needs to do in order to take it. Now, I, I have these first two points for it. We have a promise for victory, and we have a strategy for victory. A promise for victory and a strategy for victory. And in every part of life, these are the two things that we need to keep in mind as we're leading as uh, um, our homes, as uh, husbands and wives, as um, moms and dads, we need to be keeping in mind the promise from God and the strategy of how to accomplish it. This week, for me, has been a lot about just uh, um, looking at what the promises are to the Father's house and then looking to the Lord, and it's not just this week, it's a season, looking to the Lord for the strategy of how He wants us to accomplish it. Um, the Lord gives promises to uh, different children, and, and a lot of them are very similar, right? I'm, I'm going to give you this city. I'm going to give you this part of the city. I'm going to um, uh, give you a, a, a church that accomplishes this particular mission in the community. He gives a promise, and then he gives a strategy of how he's going to accomplish it. I think the danger for us is to assume that because we have the promise, that every step we take moving forward is going to give us the promise. But we need the promise from the Lord, we need to know that the promise is very well, and then we need the strategy from the Lord how we are going to possess what it is He's promised us. For 40 years, the Israelites have known that when this curse, this 40-year curse is up, we're taking the promised land. We're not sure how we're going to cross, get across the Jordan River. We're not sure what we're going to do about the giants or the iron chariots or the, the, the technological advantage they have with their weapons. But we do know this. He promised us that land. That's why we call it, you ready? The promised land, all right? Uh, it's, it's a complicated book. And uh, so he, he gave us this land. That's for us. But we need a strategy that's going to help us. When God gives you a prophetic word, a promise, you hold that close, you receive it from the Lord, and one way to steward and receive it is to seek his strategy for how to accomplish it. When he gives you the time, uh, uh, 
a young couple falls in love and gets married. And they assume because they met the one that God wanted them to have, they're sure that this is the one from the Lord, then their marriage is going to be just fine. And then three or five or seven days or months or years, hopefully. Uh, but, but later, they're like, nah, it wasn't the Lord. I made the wrong decision. No, no. The promise they got was from the Lord, but they never sought a strategy. They started using the world's methods to steward God's gift. And, and that's going to mess us up. If, as a church, we use worldly methods to accomplish God's purpose, then it's going to mess us up. Um, if, we, if we are uh, very concerned about what other people think, what the world thinks, and we're not worried about what the Lord wants or thinks, and this promise of the gates of hell will not prevail against you, all of a sudden, it's null and void. Because Christ's church keeps moving. The church of Jesus Christ keeps moving. But when a branch cuts itself off because it stops being connected to Jesus, then it just falls and it withers and it's burned. And the people disperse to another church, hopefully. But if as a church we we come together, and we are, gathering together in prayer and seeking God's face, we look at the promise, we look at the ways the Lord's um, uh, revealed that promise to us through His Scriptures. I mean, our church has a mandate from the Word of God to reach our Jerusalem. And then the different facets of that, that come from prophetic words, that come from different passages outside of that that he may highlight. We, we look to those things, we, we pray over those things, and we look and say, Lord, now you promised us this, how do you want us to accomplish it? So while we've got a promised land, but if we just go in there uh, unprepared, if we just you know, take typical military tactics and try to attack these walls that were built by giants, that are so big that people live inside of them, they're the biggest walls we've ever seen. They are impregnable. Um, they, they, they are intimidating. And so if we just take our collective few weapons that we've gathered from d- these skirmishes in the last 40 years, we're going to lose. So we need a strategy from the Lord. And if the Father's house says, well, Lord, you gave us a new name. We know we've got leadership that prays. I pray more than... I used to, so we must be doing great. Here we go. And we just run forward with with, uh, this um, assumption, this entitlement. Um, Then we we put ourselves in, in 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 a place of danger. This is actually the time for us to cling to the promise and look to the Lord together for strategy. Praying for the leadership to have strategy praying to our own hearts about the ministries that we oversee, whether it's the teaching the children or uh, teaching the teens, uh, the programs, whether it's um, the ladies or men's ministry, or it's a ministry that needs to be launched still to come. It's our evangelism, the way we invite people to church, how we reach our neighbors, how we do power evangelism, how we walk out our gifts, how we pray together, how we do worship ministry together, all of these things need the Lord's revelation. We need to ascend into the Lord's presence and see what He wants to say about our situation. And not just when it comes to the church, but in our marriages and our families. Lord, we we know that the promises, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Turns out I really need your strategy here. How do you want to build my house? How do you want to work in my heart? The promise for victory needs to be accompanied by the strategy. The promise, I have given you. The strategy, this is what you should do. He uses the words, should, uh, you and your soldiers should follow the priests. In this case, the strategy is going to be following the glory of God and then rejoicing in the glory of God. They're going to follow the ark and the priests around. You got soldiers and you got preachers walking around seven days. The men of war are walking around, and uh, they're following the priests. They're following the men of God, and uh, there's this collaboration. There's this unity, because what the Lord promised, He will give. He will fulfill, and the reason we know that is because He's told us not just what He's going to do, He's told us what we need to do in order to uh, receive it and follow it out. So we have a promise and a strategy. Just think in your hearts right now. What's an area of my life where I'm not getting what God promised me? 
You know, I, I, I'm not getting what God makes available. Maybe that's a better way of saying it. You know, I, I, I think that God can make a, a relationship healthy and happy. He can make a great home. What's an area in my life? What, what's the strategy I'm missing? So he, he gives them the strategy. Uh, thirdly, we have the war cry of victory. Verse 5, when you hear the priests give one long blast on the ram's horns, have all the people shout as loud as they can. Then the walls of the town will collapse. They got the, the shofar, the, uh, the ram's horn, this uh, uh, war cry, uh, the shout of the people, and uh, the walls begin to crack. That's the promise. That's the strategy. We're going to roar. We're going to worship. This would have really ruined uh, a lot of church services, right? Here's our strategy to have a great church today. We are going to just let it out as loud as we can. Like, I'm out. <laughs> right? I mean, like, most people go to church, they're like, I just want to sit here, and you do the, well, don't yell, Pastor. If you do, keep it short. And, and then when we're done, I'll be, I'll be gone. But here is this, um, this new way to win a battle. And they, they've already seen some unique ways. They've already seen Moses and, Josh, and Aaron and Hur go to the top of the mountain. And like he has his hands up and they're winning. And his hands go down, they're losing. I'm sure uh, uh, that was a unique experience to see the battle fought in, uh, in, uh, in, such a, in such a different way. But we see the war cry of victory. And then we get the narrative. So verses 6 through 25 are the narrative of, of the story. We didn't read them. Um, but they do what the Lord told them to do. They follow the priests, and uh, they walk around. Early in the morning, they get up. They walk around once. Next day, early in the morning, they get up. They walk around once. Day three, early in the morning, they get up. They walk around. Day four, early in the morning, they get up. They walk around. Day five, early in the morning, they get up. They walk around. Day six, early in the morning, they get up. Walk around. Day seven, early in the morning, they get up. They walk around, and 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 they walk around. And the ram's horns blow. And the men shout, and the walls come down. Hallelujah. In the middle of all this is a prostitute with a little red rope hanging out of her window. And every day she watches them walk. And every day she's like, did they remember? Right? I try to make eye contact, look down at the you know, 200,000 soldiers. See if you see the two. I promise you you'd be okay. I need like a thumbs up or something, you know. Are we good? Am I good? In the middle of those laps, she's got that rope, shaking that rope, just in case they can't see it very well. It's a big, it's a big wall and it's a small rope. I'm here. <laughs> just don't forget us. And uh, in the middle, you've got this salvation in the middle of the victory, a rescue. This little glimpse of mercy in a story of judgment. Like I actually stopped right before uh, verse 21. They completely destroyed everything in it with their swords, men and women, young and old. I just didn't think that, you know. But in the middle of this judgment against these people, and when we get to Joshua 10, we'll talk about why the judgment. We'll try to have a proper biblical perspective on this judgment. But Rahab is rescued. She's rescued from the judgment to come. One of the, well, let me say this again. The most important thing to us at the Father's house is that you would know that you've been rescued from the judgment to come. That's what's most important. Um, that our kids, our teens, our young adults, our middle-aged adults who still think they're young, our more experienced adults, and our extremely experienced adults would all know that when they take their last breath, that they're under the blood, that the scarlet rope of Christ's blood has rescued them from the judgment to come. I've been asking the Lord for words of knowledge. I have one word of knowledge for you this morning. It might not be true. If this is for you, why don't you tell me after the service? Someone woke up uh, in the middle of the night or could not get to sleep to, uh, this evening or sometime this week at night 
because they were troubled about the salvation. I got the impression that the Lord woke you up and told you you should be troubled about your salvation. That impression could be wrong. This word of knowledge could be wrong. But I wanted to share it. And uh, if that was you, I want you to come tell me after the service. Um, if you're watching online and you've made it this far in the message, you're still online, you heard that, then I want you to message me. Ken at Faith Without Church. Uh, I want to know if that was you. Because the Lord is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And we get the idea that there was one person in Jericho who wasn't, a, it wasn't fear, but it was a desire, it was a belief that she would be rescued if she put her faith in Yahweh, and she was rescued. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. If you want the rescue, if you want to be delivered from the judgment to come, then if you cry out to Jesus and put your faith in his shed blood on the cross of Calvary, you will be saved. There is salvation and victory to come. Her salvation made the whole victory her victory. She got to rejoice. These people became her people, and she got to celebrate the win. She got to rejoice, and her family got to rejoice. There was a sparing. And you have no idea how your salvation can impact people around you. When you're doubting your salvation, when you're doubting and, and worrying about what the Lord, uh, uh, whether you know the Lord or not, or you know you don't know the Lord, your fear, uh, uh, your worry, your, your, your desire to, to uh, hide that is keeping other people around you from being saved. Rahab's faith and willingness to help the spies and reach out and ask for rescue did not just spare her, but it spared her entire family. When the walls fell, there was one little portion of the wall where a family was protected. And the two spies were sent in. In verses 22 and 23, we see that. They were sent in to rescue Rahab. We're passionate at the Father's house about people being saved. It is a win for us when people come to know Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, if you have doubts, then I hope when we pray together at the end, You'll share that with me. And then, lastly, in this uh, uh, introduction, we see the holiness of the victory. The holiness of the victory. The Lord says, I want you to leave behind the spoils, the precious metals, the treasures you find. This first fruit of your victories is mine. The Old Testament, they have a law of tithing. The first fruits, they had a, they had a whole, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles was a, uh, which became Pentecost, was an entire celebration, which was celebrating the harvest to come. And so you took the first part of the harvest, you, week, you worked a week of harvesting, you stopped, and you had a party celebrating the harvest. You hadn't picked it all, and, uh, as I understand it. And so there, this was, the, this was a, a first fruit move right here. Uh, the first victory, you're going you're gonna to raid a lot of places, and you're gonna let, I'm going to let you have everything you take that, that, you, that you find and discover. But this one is mine. Putting the Lord first. As Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness is a principle that brings great success. When you put the Lord first in your life, with your time and your resources, it brings incredible success and joy. It strengthens and deepens your heart in your love for the Lord. It makes him a priority. What you do with your resources and the order you do it in makes the Lord a priority. Uh, Paul said that um, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. And I, I think part of the cheerfulness, part of the, the, uh, the joy in giving is when we, we stop and we celebrate the provision of the Lord and we set aside first something for Him. Whether it is finance, financially or it's our time or it's some way that He's blessed us, when we're stopping immediately at the beginning of the blessing and saying, Lord, this is yours, it deepens our relationship with Him. And so we see the holiness of the victory. Uh, this is set apart for the Lord. That's the account of the story. And I just want to make some application this morning. Jericho is like a really obvious wall. A real obvious set of walls that's built up by the enemy to intimidate people. The enemy knew what land was promised to Abraham. And so, hundreds of years before, um, 500 years before, 
You can visit Jericho, by the way, in the Holy Land. It's called the world's oldest city. It has been rebuilt at the cost. There was a curse that came at the end of his rebuilding, and the story of, it, of some of it being rebuilt is there. The walls are not there. Uh, it's some disappointing mounds now. Uh, it's uh, the, wall, the city of Jericho now, as they call it, the world's oldest city. It's been excavated, and, uh, and, and so you can visit there for the signage. But it's one of the least interesting sites, in my opinion, that I saw at the Holy Land. Um, but at that time, when Abraham was given this land of promise, the enemy knew that this land was going to be invaded and, and, and the Lord was going to take this for his possession. And so besides having giants, besides the other intimidating things that those uh, ten bad spies became afraid of some 40 years earlier, there was this city. The first city you came to was this giant, intimidating, walled city which said, you shall not pass, to quote Lord of the Rings. And uh, to, uh, uh, it, it said, you can't come any further. And there are walls like that built up in our lives today that intimidate us to the point where we accept their existence and we go another direction. Some of you are living a life in a, a place outside of God's blessing because there's walls that the enemy has used to intimidate you. Walls that have been built that look impregnable, indestructible. They look uh, uh, so fearsome and uh, so strong that you've decided to just accept them. We see this in our American culture of the church. Perversion, lust, pornography, depression, um, uh, and uh, broken relationships, broken families, uh, um, the, the distance that's set, the estrangement between fathers and sons and mothers and daughters. We, we see these uh, different walls that are built where the American church and, and many churches around the world, believers around the world, have just said, there's nothing we can do about it. That's just a wall that's going to be there. The wall of disunity between believers, disunity between denominations. Strife, these are walls that we just put up with. I just, we're not going to get along. Can't get along with Lutherans. Can't get along with cessationists. These are just walls that are going to be up. And I think this story is a cry to us, a promise to us, to every believer who reads it, that if the wall was built by the enemy, then the Lord wants to tear it down. And the Lord will tear it down if you'll have faith in His promise and you will pursue His strategy for the victory. This morning, I think there's some walls that the Lord wants to tear down uh, right now. I think the Lord wants to give you a word of knowledge in your heart and tell you that there's something He wants to tear down in your life. We're going to have a ch- an opportunity to come forward, a small group this morning. It's Vacation Sunday. We just didn't get the memo, apparently. And, uh, uh, and, and we'll have a chance this morning, though, to come forward together, and we will we'll pray together about those walls. But you have to take the step of faith. You've got to make that little walk. You don't have to walk around the building seven times. You just got to walk a few steps forward and ask for prayer. You have to be willing to ask and just say, I think the Lord wants to, wants, wants to tear down a wall in my life because I believe the Lord wants to do that. I think there's areas of bondage. You just don't feel right. You've been hindered by a spirit of suicide, a spirit of darkness that's encroaching on your thoughts, that's been hurting you and hindering you and taking your joy and robbing you. The, the enemy comes, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. And there's parts of your life that have been walled off by the enemy, and he wants to tear those down. I believe this morning that there is freedom that, that the Lord wants to give, and he wants to completely flatten the wall so that not one little negative lie rests upon another. I think in a lot of our cases, our walls are lies built upon another. The Apostle Paul calls them strongholds in the book of 2 Corinthians. It's lie after lie after lie that's built up so that we believe in it, and it it governs how we live. We believe this lie, and things are going to have to be that way. We believe, for example, that that Republicans and Democrats are always going to be that way in America, right? That's an example of something we all just kind of believe. Like, this is always going to be this way, right? According to who? According to what? The news? Right? It's just a, 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 a silly example. But in our lives, there's things that are, that are, are drilled deep into our hearts. Like, like this wall that had a foundation in order to sustain it and hold it up and, uh, and keep it so strong. It's been anchored deep in our heart. 
but it's, it's, it's rooted in a lie. It's a stronghold. And the Bible says that we can tear down strongholds through the might of God. That the truth of God helps us cast down the bad thoughts about those strongholds, and, and the, which are called imaginations, and it'll tear down that fortress of deceit, that fortress of torment that so often has hurt us and antagonized us and accused us and jerked us around. The power of God in one moment can tear down a wall that it took 30 years to build. Just one moment of worship, one moment of praise, one cry from the people of God in the presence of God, claiming His promise, destroyed walls that have been built over generations. Speaking of generations, maybe there's a wall that was built by your grandpa or your great-grandmother that four generations later is still visiting you. A pattern of iniquity, a recurring pattern that comes over and over again. And it's just the way we are. You know how we scops are. You know how grandpa or uncle or whatever, as I said, I, I can think of some. And I'll be here for, for prayer in a minute. And, uh, and, uh, and you, know, we, oh, you know how my family was, right? And you, you think about it, and just, that's just the way things are. Jericho's walls have been there as long as I can remember. But then there was a day when they weren't there, right? There was a day we'll never forget when the people of God just said, come down, right? You're going to hear the shofar, and then you're going to shout. I don't know what they shouted, right? Glory to God in the highest, or the battle belongs to the Lord. That's probably what they shouted. And, uh, and the battle is the Lord's, right? They shout it, and down come the walls. Down come the walls. Down come the walls. Right now, your mind might be filled with thoughts like, and maybe these Jewish soldiers had as they marched around the walls. This isn't going to work. It can't be that simple. Not for me. But when you have the faith to step forward and acknowledge that the Lord has given you a promise, and now in the house of God we have a strategy, the power of God is going to take those walls down. Uh, this week I watched a blind man, a video of a blind man in Houston be healed. Uh, blind all of his life. I watched him get prayed for at the front of his church and be healed. You talk about a wall coming down, right? All your life. I watched a pastor who was suicidal get delivered at the front, uh, an invitation, like next to me. Uh, I, uh, um, we saw testimonies and heard testimonies of people being set free. And you talk about walls coming down. Discouragement, desire to quit, broken relationships. Physical illnesses. Things that we've just come to accept because they've been there all of our lives. I believe the Lord wants to tear walls down. I don't want us to be intimidated by the walls of the enemy anymore. I don't want us to give up in crying against those walls. I don't want us to stop asking the Lord for his strategy on those walls. Jesus talks in Matthew 7 and, uh, and throughout the Gospels of people who pray and they rail against these walls. They rail against the limitations. The, the widow against the unjust judge, she vexed him day and night to get her way and the wall came down. God is looking for a people that will, in faith, step out and they'll cry out. The, the seven days speak to a completion of faith. It wasn't the first day the wall came down. And some of you have prayed before for healing, and you've prayed before for freedom, and you've prayed for, before for deliverance, and it just felt like a day around the walls, and the walls were still standing. And maybe day after day after day, you have cried, like that widow did against the unjust judge. Day after day, you have begged, 
Like the man at the pool of Bethesda, waiting for the water to stir. Day after day, you have hoped against hope that God would do something, that Jesus of Nazareth would pass by, and then one day he did. Fourteen years of bleeding, and the bleeding didn't stop, but one day you touched the hem of his garden garment. Uh, hours passing as a child got sicker and sicker, but one day Jesus said, your faith has made your daughter whole. Uh, waiting and waiting and waiting for God to do something. Begging at the gate beautiful as Jesus passed by over and over again, until one day Peter and John said, rise up and walk in the name of Jesus. You've been walking around these walls for a long time. Your grandpa struggled with it. Your dad struggled with it. Now you struggle with it. It's been a constant curse, a constant struggle, a constant source of, of discouragement and torment. And, and it's always going to be there. But then one day you realize, you know what? One more time I'm going to pray against it. One more time I'm going to walk around it. One more time I'm going to cry against it. Because Jesus is faithful to his promise. And he said he would do it. And so I'm going to call out to him to do it one more time. And I'm not going to lose faith. And I'm not going to give up. I'm going to roar against these walls one more time. This roar honors God. And so if nothing else, I'm going to honor God with my roar. But I'm not just going to roar for the sake of honor. I'm going to roar for the fulfillment. I'm going to roar to receive. I want this wall to come down. And I think the Father's house needs to start Sundays off with walls coming down. And so some music's going to play, and we're going to come forward, and we're going to pray. All of-